So welcome again. My name is Fiona Wilson, and I have the honor of serving as the Deputy Chief Sustainability Officer at the University of New Hampshire and as Director of our Sustainability Institute. We're delighted that you could join us today, albeit virtually, to UNH, uh, the state's flagship public university. We're a national leader in sustainability in higher education, and we're delighted to host this first Changemaker Speaker Series of this academic year. The Changemaker Speaker Series is one of a number of programs that are organized here at UNH by the Changemaker Collaborative. The Collaborative is an exciting collaboration between the Sustainability Institute with our partners at the Paul College of Business and Economics and the Carsey School of Public Policy. We bring together students, faculty, staff, and businesses, as well as nonprofits and government agencies, all committed to advancing positive change for the good of all. The Collaborative is about supporting the next generation of skilled, courageous, and confident leaders through real world experiences and the tools of public policy and business while helping our community partners advance their own sustainability initiatives. We embarked on this partnership because we understand that the scale and complexity of the world's challenges, including the climate crisis and racial injustice, must be addressed by collaboration across public, private, and nonprofit sectors. And today's, uh, today's program is going to be a great example of that collaboration across sectors. We know that the tools of public policy and ethically governed commerce are critically important to migrating and adapting to these challenges in a just and equitable way. For students in the audience today, we encourage you to um, check out the various programs that are offered by the Changemaker Collaborative that will allow you to get hands-on experience in sustainability, working alongside community partners and students from all majors. We're delighted to partner today with the Responsible Governance and Sustainable Citizenship Project here at the University of New Hampshire's College of Liberal Arts, and also with our wonderful partners, New Hampshire Businesses for Social Responsibility. Thank you to both of these organizations. And I'd also like to thank our faculty partners, colleagues from across campus who are bringing students to today's event as part of their courses. So welcome to our faculty colleagues and all of the students from those classes. We host the Changemaker Speaker Series because we know the vital importance of shining a light on both on innovative practices that are advancing sustainability in meaningful ways and on pioneers and thought leaders like the ones you're going to be hearing from today. We're delighted to welcome back to UNH alum, alum Tom Hayes, CEO of Ocean Spray, as well as our wonderful colleagues and partners, Niaz Dori and Gerardo Espinosa. My colleague, Dr. Tom, Tom Kelly, UNH's Chief Sustainability Officer and Executive Director of our Sustainability Institute, will be the moderator for today's conversation and will introduce you to our speakers. In addition to Tom's leadership of sustainability at UNH over the last 25 years, he is a recognized thought leader and expert in sustainable food systems regionally and globally. I couldn't think of anybody better to be convening this conversation today than my friend and mentor and colleague, Dr. Tom Kelly. Over to you, Tom. Thank you, Fiona. Um, well, let me add my welcome to everyone uh, to this conversation about building a sustainable food system through democratic empowerment and enlightened leadership. As Fiona said, we have a wonderful set of speakers to help us identify and explore critical questions around food system transformation in these extraordinary times. As many of you know, and as Fiona mentioned, UNH is a national leader in sustainability. It has the longest standing university-wide sustainability initiative in the country. And I've had the honor and privilege of leading that um, for 25 years and facilitating collaboration with colleagues and partners on and well beyond campus. And importantly for today's conversation, as the image shows, the framework that has guided our efforts over the last two and a half decades has always seen food systems as an integral component of sustainability. The central concern of which is human dignity and ecological integrity for all people in all places. And our approach has always reflected the findings and recommendations and principles of the international scientific and policy community, as well as civil society. Oh, I need to advance my slide. 
Our work is transdisciplinary and includes building collaborative networks within the state and the region to advance food system sustainability, grounded in shared values of sustainable farming and fishing, racial equity, trust, democratic empowerment, and dignity for all. Here, I'm calling out two examples, Food Solutions New England, a six-state regional network that published the New England Food Vision in 2014, that looks to the region to produce 50% of our food by 2060 through sustainable farming and fishing, healthy food for all, and thriving rural and urban communities with racial equity at the core of this work. The FSNE network has been connecting aligned efforts around the region for the last 10 years, and will be doing so for at least the next 10 years, if not more. And the New Hampshire Food Alliance is doing the same work here in the state of New Hampshire since 2013. And that includes the New Hampshire Farm to School program that we collaboratively launched in 2004. Currently, the Sustainable Development Goals are one of the international frameworks in the larger 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda that also helps guide our work. And of course, food systems are woven throughout the Sustainable Development Goals, which we uh, always emphasize critically need to be understood as a single integrated paradigm, not separate uh, and discrete uh, questions. All of the SDGs are interdependent, which is why when we're talking about food, a food system perspective is so important to draw out the many connections and interactions that make up the food system. Here's an image that the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN expressed that by placing food and agriculture, and we would include fisheries, at the center surrounded by all 17 SDGs, including strong institutions such as the cooperatives that we'll be exploring today. There is an urgency, and I'm just going to make sure that the red alert is on all of them. There we go. There's an urgency to the question of how we can build sustainable food systems through democratic empowerment and enlightened leadership. The pandemic has revealed more starkly than ever the weaknesses and vulnerability of our dominant food system and just how far we have to go in order to create a robust, resilient, healthy, and just food system, a sustainable food system. The pandemic has also driven home the urgency of the transformation many of us have been working for. It has shown even more clearly the economic and racial inequities in the food system, in access to food, access to land and fishing rights, labor conditions, and in the lack of fair prices that meet food providers' true costs of operation. The broader racial justice crisis illuminated over the past year and a half has reinforced this need for transformation still more urgently and highlighted the inability of our food system to provide something as basic as food security to our region during this crisis. And now as the climate crisis bears down upon efforts across the country and around the world to build sustainable food systems with so much at stake for so many, we see that as demonstrated at the recent UN Food Systems Summit, there are deeply conflicting values and interests and power dynamics around the future of food systems across the world. So in this context, we turn to our speakers to dig deeper into these questions. And we begin with Tom Hayes, president and CEO of Ocean Spray, a cooperative of more than 700 grower owners and 2,000 employees. And in terms of sustainability, it's coming up on its 100 year anniversary. Tom is going to share insights about the cooperative structure and governance and how it relates to sustainability and resilience. As Fiona mentioned, Tom is a UNH alum and we are delighted to welcome him back virtually to campus. So Tom, over to you. 
Outstanding. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, Kelly, and uh, thank you, Fiona. It's great to uh, be with all of you. Uh, I was just at campus last weekend for a homecoming, and it was a fantastic experience, and uh, may have bumped into a few of you. And uh, I really uh, appreciate the time to, to speak and looking forward to also answering any questions that we might have at the end. You know, I um, think this will be a great conversation. You know, this is a very difficult topic. It's something that I've been working, uh, you know, with and on in my entire career since uh, leaving UNH because I've been in the food business the entire time. And, you know, it takes everybody to, you know, try to work together to get things, uh, get things uh, moving in a better direction. And so I, I appreciate UNH for convening this. And, and again, Fiona and Tom, thank you. <clears throat> now I'm looking forward to talking about Ocean Spray. Ocean Spray is a wonderful agricultural co-op and our focus is sustainability uh, and not just the planet and everything that, you know, sort of we touch, but our farmers' well-being. It's a cooperative made up of owners that are close to 700 farmers that uh, have a real passion for what they do. And at the center of that is taking care of the environment. Um, before we go there, I wanted to start with just a couple of things about me, uh, since most of you, I've, of course, haven't uh, met. And, you know, the uh, my, my business, you know, uh, career started uh, very early on, but I'd say I, I don't just don't just skateboard. Some of you might have seen that TikTok adventure, and uh, which was amazing. If uh, those of you that are in marketing, we got a lot of impressions off this unique situation that happened uh, last year around this time, where uh, a uh, TikTok user posted himself drinking cran raspberry after his truck tr broke down, and uh, boy, it took off uh, like crazy. And we were happy to be a part of that, and it was a real sort of positive moment and. You know, time in which people are uh, were struggling, still are struggling. So um, I just maybe made the assumption that there are a few TikTok users out there. So uh, let me talk about going, you know, from UNH to Ocean Spray. You know, my background is I grew up in Merrimack, New Hampshire, and I started my career in food working as a dishwasher at a restaurant uh, that was about four houses down the road from where I grew up, so I could walk there. I started. Uh, when I was uh, 15 years old and uh, never worked uh, less than 20 hours a week in the food industry since then, even through uh, going to UNH. I uh, worked at, I don't know if it's still there, Tom or Fiona, a restaurant called Benjamin's that was um, had been there for a while. I've probably gone by now, but would do things uh, like dishwashing and bartending and so forth. And uh, really, really enjoyed uh, the business, got sucked right in. So um, my career spanned, I started out of school with a company called HP Hood, which you may know, uh, which is a dairy company, and then moved on to Kraft Foods. I've worked with a company called ConAgra, and then I wound up with Sara Lee, and Sara Lee went through a lot of sort of changes, became Hillshire Brands, um, and then long story short, it was acquired by Tyson and uh, became CEO of Tyson. Um, and I was there for about 15 years. Um, I was asked to join Ocean Spray. The reason why I uh, dove with the opportunity, uh, I love you know, New England, of course, and it was right in our backyard here, but Ocean Spray is a compelling place to work. It's an agricultural cooperative, but one that's been very successful. It's got a 90 year heritage. It's made up of you know, large and small farms. And uh, anybody that would come here and have a chance to experience working uh, with our group would tell you that it's uh, really, there's no confusion about who we work for, a very strong work ethic across the company, as well as, you know, for our grower owners. And, you know, they are connected, connected to uh, what we do, started very sort of small level, right, when the company was founded in 1930, but as you know, we are a much bigger company now, about $2 billion in sales. Uh, but that spirit of uh, sort of grittiness and, you know, taking things uh, bull by the horns has really sort of flowed through and uh, really proud to, to work here and see that firsthand. And I was uh, thrilled at the opportunity to, to jump in. So the company, uh, like I said, was founded in 1930, and uh, it was three independent grower owners. So they owned bogs in Massachusetts, two of them, and one of them in New Jersey. Um, I keep looking out this way because our office sits right on a bog and it's a beautiful day out there. 
Um, and one of the owners was, the original founders was one by the name of Elizabeth Lee. And she was a real innovator for her time. She actually created the uh, cranberry sauce that we all you know, know and love and that we have at Thanksgiving. Hopefully most of you do. And that turned into that one product, you know, many more growers coming together. So it started in New England here in Southeastern Massachusetts. I'm in the Lakeville, Massachusetts office today. But now we have uh, farms in other parts of the United States, New Jersey, Wisconsin's really big, uh, the northwestern part of the United States in Washington and Oregon, uh, Western Canada, Eastern Canada, and our largest growing region right now is actually in South America and Chile. So um, worldwide company. And uh, so it's quite different uh, than you know, from 1930. And also I'd say quite different than your typical uh, CPG company. <clears throat> So as you well know, companies are made up of usually boarded directors as a governing body. And, uh, but very different uh, co-op is the ownership. It votes for who would be those uh, individual representatives of their regions. And those shareholders are um, you know, the ones that own the company. And so it's, it's really, really clear on you know, what your mission is. And that is to make the most money you can do it in the way that you know balances the needs of the present with the needs of the future, which is you know what we do as we uh, work through sustainability. Uh, but 100% of our profits go back to the grower owners. So if we don't do a good job, they won't have enough money to uh, put their kids through school and do the things that they want to do. So there's it's really compelling you know to make uh, make that connection to everything that we do really affects them you know um, really directly. So different than in a public company environment. When I was CEO at Tyson, we had shareholders as well, of course, but they were more sort of nameless, faceless shareholders. And you do a lot of things like non-deal roadshows and you talk to investment banks, but you wouldn't have the opportunity to sit in front of you know, your owners uh, almost on a daily basis, at least uh, on a quarterly basis. So they're families that we know, we meet their kids. Uh, we're gonna have on uh, November 7th, uh, Family Farm Day here, our, our team members will come in and actually get into the bog. We take pictures, it's a big celebration. A little bit different this year, uh, dealing with the Delta variant, but a you know, celebration of the harvest, which is really, really cool. So it's a unique structure. And I think you know, one that uh, really compels our team members to, to step up and innovate. And as you can expect, I mean, these, these small family farms, they are folks that have trusted us uh, for the financial health of their co-op, but also they trust us to take care of the environment and um, all elements of ESG along the way. You know, getting to sort of what it looks like, the, the farms and the longevity, uh, they are small. It's not big ag. You know, the average farm size is about uh, 18 acres compared to think of the average average farm uh, around the US is uh, closer to 500 acres, about uh, 450. And, you know, so being a part of the co-op, you know, provides, you know, this value that they don't get naturally if they were to just be uh, independently sort of going at the market themselves. And then we, there are for sure, you know, independent growers out there, but they don't have the brand that Ocean Spray has, it's been built and it has been, you know, not only resilient, but I would say it's been well marketed throughout the years and has is a great example of how when these growers came together, they put something together really, really special. Um, so the team is focused on, you know, new innovation, bringing the, bringing the product, you know, further around the world to new consumers. Uh, it is a super fruit, super food. So we're really, um, you know, trying to take advantage of putting that in front of people, letting them understand, you know, the goodness that, you know, cranberries can bring, you know, to their lives, <clears throat> but to also make sure they're understanding that this is more about just creating demand for us. We want to make sure they uh, know that this is something that is building, you know, some fantastic lifestyles for our farmer owners, as like I said, they receive all the profits that we make. So uh, what do we do with those profits? Uh, they go to our owners and we reinvest, uh, certainly uh, they reinvest in their farms, but they also uh, hold back some of that, or those earnings for equity for the company. The company's gonna build you know, plants. We have to invest in marketing. 
We have, you know, a lot of things that a normal CPG company would have to uh, spend money on. And so we um, do that in order to keep the company moving and moving forward in a, you know, sustainable way. You know, that is uh, the proof is in the pudding, as they say, you know, uh, the company has been in the hands of generations of farmers. If you go back even before the co-op was, was founded, cranberry farming in southeastern Massachusetts has been around since the early 1800s. But on average, um, two and a half generations across our 700 owners have you know, um, been a part of what is now Ocean Spray. And uh, about 25% of those farmer owners are fourth generation or longer. Uh, so actually, one of our big growers in New Jersey uh, has pictures on the walls of you know, his, uh, all of his family that's been involved in the cranberry business. It goes back to the 1850s, and it's, uh, it's pretty cool. So this relationship is, you know, really built on tradition and, you know, farming, but also uh, the cranberry itself. Uh, you would think, boy, how can you sell $2 billion worth of cranberries around the world? It's because the cooperative has been really focused on just one thing. And so many companies, you know, it's hard, right? You have a lot of competing interests. You start to get a little scattered. And it's a it's an opportunity for Ocean Spray as well to go further and make money that's not necessarily from cranberries, but can be helpful with other categories of where the brand can go. Something that we're dealing with right now, but um, what's really important is that this has been going on for a long time. The, the growers are very focused on doing the right thing, and it's been been a nice uh, nice adventure for us. So. Um, this is not to say, I want to make sure everybody's uh, really clear that the cooperative model is like the be, on, be all and end all. It's not. Uh, there are a lot of models out there that can be extraordinarily successful. So it's not the utopian structure, not the answer um, about how small farms and even large farms should operate you know, together. But I'd say in the case of Ocean Spray, it has been very successful. Um, you know, 90 years you know, at this and last year, uh, the co-op made more earnings than ever in its 90 year history. So um, it's been challenging times for a lot of farms, but the, the team has been doing a nice job. So um, talking about, you know, why that is and, and why that this sort of is something that's compelling to people, you have to start with the purpose of our company and it's on the, the slide here, but it is to connect our farms to our families and in particular connecting them to the families for, to make a better life and it's better life through nutrition and you know products that they're going to consume but also you know just bringing those moments uh, we think about thanksgiving and other moments that are exciting for us and and a part of our daily life that is uh, going to make people satisfied or fulfilled or not uh, that's what we want to be a part of and you know, it's, uh, it's our families that run the company and it's the families that we want, your families and consumer families will want to enjoy the products and sort of bring that to the table of everybody around the world. But getting into our vision, that is uh, very simple. We wanna take what we believe has been a really strong heritage of innovation and, and you know, creativity, starting with Elizabeth Lee and that, you know, uh, cranberry sauce can and bring those products and new products to consumers around the world and making sure that they understand that our vision is, you know, really to, to uh, drive this super fruits awareness, um, you know, to every corner that we can. So um, when I arrived, we had a set of values that were uh, printed on the wall and they were, I think, you know, uh, they were decent, but the team and I decided that we should be really focused on what makes Ocean Spray unique. And so I wanted to touch on this just briefly because it's, it is very important to the, to the company. If you were to talk to people that work here, they'd, they'd say they're um, you know, super excited about rolling this out and running the business against these values. But first and foremost, we are focused on growers. So we have a grower mindset. And that means being resilient, making sure that we're embracing all the challenges and the opportunities of the business. Uh, we do 
make, we need to make sure, and we do make sure that we are driving results. And it's not always a straight line. There could be years where, you know, the crop is down or there's a consumer demand issue, but we want to keep results coming through and we want to make sure that those results are sustainable. So guided by our purpose, you know, we are focused on making sure returns are there, but we're doing it in a way that is, you know, balancing the needs of the present with the needs of the future. And uh, integrity. Integrity is one of those things where, um, you know, I've had whatever it's been, 32 or 33 years in business. Um, everybody will talk about it and they want to make sure they're doing the right thing. My personal opinion is that it does need to be specifically called out. So when we do things like roll out um, code of conduct or things that uh, we're doing as it relates to training on uh, all types of things that are ethical behavior at the co-op and outside of uh, even just your, your day job, that needs to be front and center. So we say integrity above all has to be there and we want it to be present and spoken about. And then last but not least, uh, inclusive teamwork. We know that we are a relatively small company when we are um, competing against you know, the likes of General Mills and you know, some of the big, big uh, guns out there. Um, and we know that every voice matters. We want every voice. We want everybody to feel welcome. And we, you know, continue to, you know, make sure that people understand that inclusive teamwork is what's going to drive us, drive us to the next stage. Let me, um, let me shift now and talk a little bit about uh, people on the planet. As I mentioned, as an agricultural co-op, we're focused on sustainability inherently, but it's really uh, fun to be a part of you know, a company that's already starting from a point of strength. Our farmers take great care, the water, soil, ecosystems, the communities around them. The farmers consider their practices of ensuring their farms and vines are sustainably managed. Uh, so uh, they take that so much to heart that they can, you know, really be an evangelist for, you know, even going further. And that's what we've been working on now with our sustainability approaches. You, know, you get decades of regenerative farming but uh, that's good. But we know that it takes a, all hands on deck to make a better system. So we want to, you know, accelerate that and go further. A um, couple of things just to mention about what we've been up to. You know, the cranberry is a fantastic regenerative product. A one acre of cranberry bog conserves about five and a half acres of natural lands. So behind, you know, this uh, computer, as I said, is, you know, we have a bog. It's, um, and it's, it's probably pretty close to the average, about an acre's worth, um, and uh, five and a half acres of uh, predominantly water wetlands. And so as it is regenerative, it revitalizes the soil, the water, the land around. The farms can actually improve the environment as we leave it uh, better than it was before, and that's what our aim is to do. So <clears throat> with that, a few years ago before I arrived, I've, I've been here for a little over a year, Ocean Spray uh, went out to become verified by a third party on the sustainability practices. And I was really happy to hear, was, I think it was about the same time I arrived at the Ocean Spray Cranberry and Cranberries were the first fruit uh, worldwide to receive the level of certification that is uh, globally sustainably grown. And it was by SAI, the Sustainable Ag Agriculture Initiative. And so I was really, really excited to hear that. And um, like I said before, even more excited to understand that the team believe they can go much further. <laughs> That's not you know, a stopping point, it's a starting point. And so, and it's not easy to achieve, by the way, there's like a hundred and some odd you know, standards, whether we treat the soil, the water, uh, the care of the animals that are on the farm. Um, and on the uh, wetlands. And so I think that's a, that's a really test, strong testament to how we've been uh, moving forward. You know, the other thing to uh, mention is that um, we are doing some work as it relates to understanding through a materiality assessment and assessment we're doing on the farms as to how much carbon we sequester. Because, you know, as uh, you know, whether it's uh, ground cover, trees, grasses, cranberry vines, they all are good for sequestering carbon. And you know, as uh, our vines grow and they are regenerative, they capture CO2 from the air, storing the carbon um, either uh, as new growth uh, or biomass. And so we have been really focused on 
what is the true impact of this? Because we want to tell the story. So we do a nice job. We want to make sure people understand the great work that we're doing. And so we can gain new consumers and you know, continue to promote our products. But it's, uh, so it's an exciting time for the sustainability team. We just, um, shortly after I arrived, I appointed uh, Katie Galley, who's our head of R&D as the chief sustainability officer in addition. And she has been you know, uh, quickly diving into the science of sustainability for ocean spray. And uh, it will, we're not ready to make any uh, big goals announcements yet, but we will be in the future making them. And what'll be nice is we'll have some really solid evidence to back it up. So um, second to last slide here, folks, I did want to talk about the next generation because as I mentioned, you know, this is something that is handed off, handed on, you know, to future generations in most of the cases at, at Ocean Spray. And you can talk to any grower uh, around the world and they would tell you that they um, have a challenge. They know that climate change is real. Uh, they're seeing it on the farms and it's, uh, it's affecting us in real time. You know, just this year in British Columbia, we had temperatures, I'm sure you, you've heard this, but um, it turned, it turned uh, you know, what was normally sort of a season where it'd be maybe in the 80s, 90s, for a couple of weeks, it was 100 and, close to 120 degrees in the Northwest. And that is just shocking and unprecedented heat. And we've also had in the Northeast, where a couple of years ago we were suffering from drought, we had extreme rains. And extreme rains mean, uh, in some cases, lower quality fruit it tends to rot. And without getting in all the details of it, it does create you know, just a lower quality. And so uh, they see it all the time. And so they want to be a part of, well, what can we do to, to go further? Um, so there's three things that we're really focused on that we think that we can make a, a big impact at Ocean Spray. One is to continue to take regenerative farming you know, even further, as I mentioned. The second is we do have plants in the manufacturing footprint. We have trucks, we have you know, um, uh, parts of our business that are not as sustainable as we'd like them to be. So we're focused on the sustainability of our operations. And then thirdly, and probably the biggest area where we would either, either have criticism or you know, just uh, criticize ourselves is on packaging. So uh, we're working to become more recyclable, uh, reusable in some case with, uh, through a partnership with Loop or compostable packaging, which our team has uh, really started to get some, I think some strong efforts on new products uh, developed with you know, compostable packaging. So, um, you know, like I said, we recently uh, stood up a materiality survey. I saw the, the sneak peek of that uh, just here yesterday, and we're going to uh, share that with our board. And then we're going to align on what we want to spend you know, our focus on in order to make sure that we achieve the ambitious goals that we're going to set for ourselves for ESG. So um, last slide, I just wanted to wrap up uh, by you know, again, saying thank you to Tom and Fiona. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you. Um, hopefully, you know, as things are a little more safe, I can be on campus more. I'd love to, you know, meet some of you um, in 3D and to have, you know, more discussions. I, I love my experience at UNH and I talk about it often. I'm on the UNH Foundation Board. It's um, something that's really made my life uh, what it is today. And so I, I'm happy to help as many people as I possibly can. Uh, but uh, I love this quote. There's a quote that says, you know, when individuals join a cooperative venture, the power generated far exceeds what they could have accomplished individually or on their own. That, of course, is true of almost anything. But when you're working for cooperatives, I, I would say generally speaking, but specifically, I can only speak to ocean spray, you feel it. You feel like the, the team is really focused on one goal. And that goal is to, you know, make a great product, do it in a sustainable way and make money for our share owners. Uh, so we can be, you know, continue to be humble, driven, empowered by the responsibility we have, but, you know, continue this on for the next generation. So anyway, that's it. I'll wrap up. Uh, thanks, Fiona. I think I'm turning it maybe back over to Tom, you or Tom. Or back to me, Tom. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was wonderful to hear. And um, 
we'll we'll be looking forward to the Q and A to dig into some of that um, follow up questions. So next, we're delighted to welcome our collaborative colleague and food system leader Niaz Dori. Niaz leads two organizations in an innovative shared leadership model: the Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance. Uh, excuse me, and uh, the National Family Farm Coalition. So this gives her a unique perspective on the structures and challenges shared by farming and fishing enterprises and communities locally as well as internationally. The National Family Farm Coalition mobilizes family farmers, fishers, and ranchers for fair prices, vibrant communities, and healthy foods free of corporate domination. And NAMA is a fisherman-led organization working at the intersection of marine conservation and social, environmental, economic, and food justice. Niaz, over to you. Thanks, Tom. Nice to be with everyone. And thanks for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. <clears throat> um, it was good to hear Tom Hayes and the history of uh, ocean spray. We have on the NFFC side, some of our dairy farmers in Wisconsin, actually they're off the dairy farm job, happens to be working for ocean spray. So I was chatting with a few of them before um, this conversation to learn more about their experience working for the company. But um, what I really wanna plug is over the last few years of working on farming and fishing issues here in the Northeast and bumping into independent farmers who grow cranberry for themselves or um, and sometimes with uh, ocean spray. I happen to be gifted a lot of cranberries over the years and always try to figure out what to do with them. And um, I want to tell everybody about one recipe that you should look up, which is the Nantucket cranberry pie. If you've not had it before, I highly recommend it, especially if you, like me, come from a culture where uh, sour and tart fruits are an important part of your culinary ad adventures, I highly recommend it. And of course, in our culture, we like to eat it raw because it's that sour element. So we get the full superfood element without even um, altering the, the fruit itself. But I wanna really talk about, aside from sharing recipes, I wanna really talk about what Tom mentioned, which is the work that I'm honored to do serving two organizations. It didn't start that way. Uh, you know, my background is uh, working on environmental justice issues. I've been a community organizer for most of my adult life, really focusing on working to address the underlying issues that are affecting something as opposed to the symptoms that we experience as a society. And um, back in the ice age, I don't know, it feels like a long time ago, I was working with Greenpeace as an environmental justice toxics campaigner. And I was asked to switch campaigns to work on ocean issues. And it wasn't until I could see the fisheries work through the lens of family farmers struggle and the farm workers work that I was familiar with before that I could really think about working with fishermen and on fisheries issues. And what struck me from the get go was how disconnected the fishery system was from the rest of our food system, the land food system, which seemed really ironic because it's the only thing we eat that actually has the word food in it. Yet when we talk about agriculture, when we talk about food systems, we don't see it anywhere. And so it really became kind of a personal mission, if you will, to find a way to elbow our way into every conversation that had something to do with food. And that's how I ended up meeting Tom Kelly, although he thinks we met a long time before Food Solutions New England. Um, but we, it was finding out about Food Solutions New England and wanting to make sure that seafood and fisheries are included into that conversation. There's a lot of reasons behind why that inclusion is important and why the exclusion is um, uh, we is really a problem. You know, we talk about food systems uh, on agriculture side. Marine animals are used to feed the pigs and the cows and the chickens. Marine animals are used to fertilize the soil. We eat marine animals on a daily basis and marine products on a daily basis, whether it's the sea salt or whether it's the nori wrapped 
sushi you eat even without the seafood in it. So it's a constant part of our food system. And to exclude it, we're really eliminating a whole segment of our food system that has in incredible economic impact, sometimes devastating uh, ecological impacts, but also a really huge social impact around the globe. There are billions of people who live in coastal areas and their main source of sustenance is from the ocean. We're not talking about those who are privileged enough to go to a restaurant and get a seafood meal. We're talking about people who literally have to go to the waters to get what they need to sustain themselves and their family on a daily basis. And so exclusion of seafood is, um, is really does a disservice to our food system conversations. What I really want to hone in on, though, is the issue of economic justice within the seafood system. We talk a lot about the um, food providers. You know, I, I call them food providers. A few years ago, we were working with some tribes in Wisconsin, and they um, told us that in their language, there is no separate word for farmer or fisher or rancher. They're all called providers. And that was a very important moment for me because it was another extension of this need to look at our food, food system holistically. So how, how do we make sure our food providers are taken care of? Tom Hayes touched on some of the values of Ocean Spray as an organization that wants to honor the growers that um, uh, you're working with. And he's right that a co-op needs to be values driven in order for those owners to be taken care of. One of those values needs to be economic justice for those uh, food providers that are part of that cooperative. While there are co-ops that are doing good, there are co-ops that food providers who are part of are actually actively fighting against because they are not getting economically just treated economically justly. Um, one of those that our farmers are fighting against all the time is Land O'Lakes, which is a co-op of dairy farmers. And you know their butter probably is the most familiar thing, but most dairy farmers that we work with who have a relationship with that cooperative have an adversarial relationship because it's not being um, directed by the farmer owners. It's being directed by essentially a board of directors that is hoarding power and profit. And so we need to really make sure that this economic justice issue is at the core, because without it, we have a food system currently that measures success based on volume. How big do you get? How much do you export? Uh, how much can you grow? How many acres you own? How many animals can you kill? How much milk can you, can you draw out of that cow? We need to switch that because that high volume system is really focused on volume and not value. And farmers, fishermen, ranchers end up needing to make ends meet based on volume. That means they got to kill more animals, they got to grow more whatever, they have to own more acres, even if it means that every one of those more junctions, they are going further and further in debt. Their input into their farm has to be more. The investment into their boats has to be more. Often it means they have to mortgage their home or other assets in order to get more into their business, not to get more out of their business. And switching this so that we're focusing on value instead of volume has to be a critical part of how we look at our food system. A rancher I met in Montana a couple of years ago on a tour we did across country, Tom joined us for a part of that tour, called the current system the moron system, I, interestingly enough, not um, as in it's moronic that we're focusing on volume and adding more and more without paying our food providers a fair price. So this idea of making sure we know what the cost of production is for our food providers and making sure that what they're getting paid first and foremost meets that cost of production. And cost of production needs to include a livable, equitable living that, that provides a life with dignity for those food providers. That includes clothes for their kids and mortgage of their homes and, more, and whatever loan they have on their car and food for the house. Most farmers can't even afford their own food because most of the profit is exiting the farm. So this idea that by the time their, the fish and the corn and the chicken arrives in the supermarket or even leaves their farm, that farmer and fisherman is actually in the red, needs to be resolved before we can really have an equitable food system. There are a lot of solutions to achieve that equity that we're talking about. We have a project at NFFC called the Disparity to Parity Project. I want to cue a short video 
that we have, um, if uh, Andy can run that, that kind of takes you through what's, pro what's the problem with the current inequity in, when it comes to economics and what is at least one solution that is um, uh, in play at the moment. Crises like pandemics and climate change are directly impacting the farmers and fishers who provide and harvest our food. They are exposing the disparities in our current food system, a system that isn't working for farmers or for you. We all have a right to access food that is nutritious, culturally appropriate, and sustainably grown, raised, and caught. We all seek health, prosperity, vibrant communities, ecological restoration, and social peace. But if we are going to realize the right to food and move our food system from disparity to parity, we need policies that guarantee fair prices and living wages for all food providers. Parity is the idea that family farmers, ranchers, and fishers should be paid fair prices for their crops, livestock, and fish that reflect the true costs of food production. More broadly, parity means that the supply of agricultural products and seafood from producer to consumer should be managed responsibly and sustainably. Right now, farmers have no control over the price they receive for their products. Prices for commodity crops, livestock, and seafood are set in global commodities markets and by giant transnational agribusiness and seafood companies and the prices aren't even based on what it costs to raise, catch, or grow our food. To earn enough money, farmers often increase their production, but this leads to overproduction, which wastes resources and food and actually drives down prices further. Across rural America, family farms, ranches, and fishing boats, as well as small businesses, are shutting down, while large agribusinesses are pocketing billions of dollars. Another consequence of overproduction is that it provides animal feed processors with lots of cheap grain. This in turn props up the polluting factory farm industry. Thousands of smaller, more diversified farms have been replaced by these factory farms and by giant farms that grow only one or two commodity crops. The impacts on family farmers, the quality of our food, and the health of our planet have been devastating. Ultimately, disparity threatens our ability to feed ourselves in a healthy way and to be resilient in the face of crises like the pandemic and the growing threat of climate change. The good news is there are practical and viable solutions. Establishing price floors or a minimum price for what farmers, ranchers, and fishers provide would be equivalent to a fair minimum wage for workers and would provide producers with stable and fair incomes. Price floors, along with responsible supply management, would also stop the cycle of overproduction and reduce the amount of cheap grain available to factory farms. And when farmers don't have to use all of their land to grow crops, they can rest parcels of land. They can rotate their crops, which reduces soil erosion, increases soil productivity and biodiversity on the farm, and makes farmland more resilient to pests and extreme weather. Change is possible. We can transform our food system by paying farmers, ranchers, fishers, and workers fair prices and a living wage, but only if corporate control over our system is dismantled. To learn more about how you can support Parity for Family Farmers, visit DisParityToParity.org. <clears throat> Thanks, Andy. Um, one of the places, and I don't know how much time I have, so I'll try to keep the closing relatively um, short. One of the places where we feel some of this needs to be addressed, and Tom Kelly touched on the UN Food System Summit, is at a global level because we can't exist in a food system that pretends to be just to be uh, with contained within national borders. And so we work nationally, we work regionally, we work locally sometimes and uh, we work internationally often. And we were part of the group of organizations fighting back and pushing back at the UN Food System Summit because we felt that it had um, undermined democratic empowerment by ignoring civil society's engagement. And it was not uh, providing enlightened leadership 
it was actually ceding leadership of the United Nation to the world economic forces. And so the counter mobilizations that happens leading up to the food system summit and will continue because the work begins, the work doesn't end when, when the summit ends, the work actually begins even um, right after. We, we need to continue to fight on all those national, international, regional levels for the values we believe in, especially this idea of fair prices and living wages for our food providers. But it doesn't always have to be a fight either. It can also happen in the context of celebration. It can ha happen in the context of conversations, collaborations. So I don't want to suggest that everything is always at a loggerhead. Uh, we actually gain more when we collaborate, when we celebrate together. When we And food gives us that opportunity to celebrate. And one of those opportunities has been working with Food Solutions New England over the last 10 years. So we hope to be able to further this idea of parity to end the disparities within our food system by focusing on the economics of it as we move this project further and kick that ball further down the, down the field when we have opportunities within the Farm Bill reauthorization, the Fish Bill reauthorization, and various other policy level conversations. So thanks, Tom. Great, thank you, Niaz. Uh, as always, very uh, thought provoking and um, thanks for all the work you do. Uh, our final speaker is Gerardo Espinosa, who has served as the executive director of LEAF, the Local Enterprise Assistance Fund, for the last nine years. LEAF's mission is to promote human and economic development by providing financing and development assistance to cooperatives and social purpose ventures that create and save jobs for low income people. LEAF lends nationally with a focus on community-owned natural food cooperatives that create high-quality jobs and provide access to healthy food in urban and rural communities, low-income cooperative housing developments and worker-owned firms and other community-based businesses and social enterprises. Gerardo, we're delighted that you could join us and we're eager to hear your insights on building sustainable food systems from all the great work that you do. Thank you, Tom, and thanks everyone for the invitation to participate in this conversation. Uh, LEAF is a, what is called a community development financial institution. So sometimes I, I think the easiest way I find to describe it is like we're like a little bank that uh, like other banks makes loans, provide financing, but our financing has to go with uh, social purpose and social impact in mind, right? And uh, in, part, in our case in particular, that social impact, uh, a small dimension of that social impact is uh, uh, focused on uh, supporting cooperatives and particularly uh, the three type of, uh, two type of cooperative, which is food, food, natural food cooperatives and worker cooperatives. And in Massachusetts, we run a program that is called the Massachusetts Food Trust Program, is to provide um, um, support, particularly grocery stores and other retail outlets in areas that don't have that access. Uh, uh, those areas sometimes are called food desert areas. And so I wanted to touch basis on these three points. Uh, the time is limited, so I'm going to focus more on food cooperatives, but I'll, I'll touch briefly on the, on the other two. And uh, I think it's always helpful to start with an illustration. How does it look like? Uh, so the pictures that you are seeing here is a food cooperative that uh, we help to finance and uh, open in Fairbanks in Alaska. And um, part of the reason why I chose these uh, cooperatives as an illustration is because of their location, they had a lot of logistics uh, problems, right, to overcome uh, before uh, opening the co-op and in terms of the type of products that they would offer and many of those products come from the uh, continental US. Uh, so in spite of all those issues, they made it happen. The next slide shows you a little bit about the, the co-op and the 
third slide shows you uh, some of the board of directors and some of the persons that were able to make the co-op happen. So just a little background on what we mean by food cooperatives. Food cooperatives are um, uh, normally established by a community, a small community group that has an interest in bringing uh, healthy food to, to, the, to their area. And uh, in the process of doing that, uh, what they do is they contact other persons, they do outreach, and uh, finally they get a larger group of community members that are interested in opening a, a store to serve that community. And the, um, they pay a small membership fee that ranges from $50 to $150. And through that membership fee, they are the owners of that community. In the like, uh, uh, Tom Kelly was, uh, Tom Hayes was mentioned in the case of uh, Ocean Sprays. The the growers are the owners of the co-op. In this case, the owners of the co-ops are the members of the community that provided that um, that membership fee. It's a one-time membership fee. And uh, then we, the next step there is to get some uh, additional financing and finally uh, arrange uh, to arrange for the opening of the store. The, so the, in the US, there are over 400 food cooperatives uh, in terms of, uh, of sales uh, volume of these uh, food cooperatives is over like $3.2 billion that uh, uh, they sell. The, the, and what is nice about the food cooperatives is um, aside from uh, being community owned, um, they have a, a number of values. And again, uh, probably this is part of where um, you will see some trends here in terms of what Tom Hayes talks about cooperatives. Uh, and that translates to, to cooperatives of different types, right? So there is a, a set of values. They want to be good, not only to their owners, but to the community. Part of being good to the community is the emphasis they have in, in purchasing from uh, local producers. So in contrast to other grocery stores, their, most of their, their um, production, or not most, but uh, significantly larger is uh, from local sources. Uh, as any grocery store, they also produce, uh, they also sell goods like uh, uh, soaps and bakery products and so on. And they try to get local uh, producers to, that can provide these, um, these products to the store. So to some extent, they're a little engine for the a, a little incubator for businesses in the community. I, I think if you want to go to, if you go, want to go to a store like, um, a, a chain store like a Star Market or a Stop and Shop, probably they have a central purchasing center, center somewhere else in the country. Uh, these fellows, you go and you talk with the general manager, they take a look at the product, they see, the type of ingredients that uh, are in the product and it matches with what they require, then they give you the shelf space. The, uh, so in terms of uh, uh, benefit to the community, you have this aspect of uh, the local, local purchasing. Uh, another element that they have is they care uh, about the people that work on the on the store, and typically the, their wages are uh, uh, like 10%, they say much, but 10, 15% higher than comparable grocery stores. The, where is, the main difference is that they do tend to employ more people full-time with benefits where other stores 
try to emphasize more part-time with, without benefits. The other element where they are particularly good at is in all these aspects, they emph emphasize recycling and emphasize being energy efficient and with all the cooling and refrigeration systems, they do really make a contribution uh, by emphasizing uh, uh, these aspects. So the and the reason why I wanted to show you this slide is because um, this one in particular is because of the of this group that you see there. There were four of them that were that initial group that um, got the community together, right? The, and uh, Tom Hayes was mentioning that Ocean Spray was created or established initially by three independent growers. And um, I guess the message that I want to convey is that to make things happen, right? Uh, sometimes this, uh, it seems uh, very difficult, but this, these are illustrations that just a small group of committed people can, uh, can make uh, things happen. The, the, so th this is a brief overview on the aspect of, of uh, food cooperatives will move to another slide of the type of work that we do. Part of what we do is, is uh, supporting worker cooperatives. And what you see here is a worker cooperative in, in Roxbury in Boston. The, uh, what they do is they offer composting services and uh, the company is owned by you there you see there are some of the members who own the company and they have been uh, recently successful at getting work with some larger institutions uh, like um, boston university and it's, it's, it's a nice example there uh, in terms of uh, the various topics we were talking the aspect of racial justice the aspect of the environment, the aspect of uh, uh, wealth inequality, they are the owners of the company. Right? So I'll move on to another project. Again, this is another worker co-op in Massachusetts. It's a hydroponic uh, greenhouse in terms of the impact on the environment. Uh, this type of project uses only one tenth of the water that would be used otherwise. And um, because it's uh, grown inside, uh, the, it, you don't need to bring the lettuces from Arizona or from California. And um, uh, being worker on, again, is one of the characteristics of this company. And finally, I'll, I'll uh, no, this is another worker company. What they do is upholstery. Um, again, it is part of that recycling process. So in, in, uh, uh, they try to, they, they work uh, with universities. Sometimes they uh, work on the seats on the stadiums. And part of the idea is rather than throw it away and, and get a new one is to to repair it and give it a new life. The, uh, now, this is, uh, this is the third area of activity that I mentioned. This is the work that we do in Massachusetts. Uh, for, um, the state of Massachusetts created a small fund that we administer. It's called the Massachusetts Fast Food Trust Program. And the idea there is to support uh, to support um, uh, particularly retailers, but other elements of the food chain, uh, um, but in areas that are food desert or low income. And these are uh, the number of projects that we have done in, in the past uh, three years. And um, what I wanted to bring uh, particularly to your attention is all this aspect of food desert areas and so on uh, is part of the concept of what is called social determinants of health, right? And uh, 
when we talk about justice, in my mind, that's one element where uh, really it's uh, very sad to see the situation. Uh, in Boston, we have a couple of neighborhoods that are one and a half miles away. The life expectancy in one is 92 years, and the life expectancy on, on the other one is 59 years. So that life expectancy puts them at, at par to places like Somalia, Somalia, Sierra Leone, and Mali, right? And the, just that clearly is just not right. So this is a, a brief description of some of the work we do. I'm happy to, to take questions during the Q&A. Great, thank you, Gerardo, very much for the work you do and for sharing that with us. So I uh, just want to encourage uh, to put your questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, we've got a couple here. So let's start with this question. So does a food cooperative share similar goals to a corporate grocery store, but scaled locally? So yeah. does a food cooperative share similar goals to a corporate grocery store, but scaled locally? Yeah. Any, of our, any of our speakers? Go ahead, Herrero, you can begin. Yeah, the, uh, I would say the goals are very different. The, uh, both of them are doing similar things. But um, again, the, the set of values and the motives are, are, are very different, right? So in terms of the, the labor, in terms of where they source the product, in terms of the quality of the product, in terms of their commitment to the community, uh, we're, we're talking recycling, we're talking about very different things. So on the surface, they look similar, but if you just dig a little bit deeper, you see a complete set of different values. Mm -hmm. Okay, so underlying the values. Um, Tom Hayes, here's a, a question for you. What makes Ocean Spray's corporate and farmer relationship different from other co-op farmer corporate relationships? Uh, wow, uh, good question. I think, you know, the thing that is the most notable, so, so there are some co-ops um, and, um, you know, I think this was sort of highlighted uh, that don't uh, simply take the proceeds and distribute them all back to the grower owners. They, you know, set a certain price uh, for the for the goods or for the commodity, and then um, you know the owners deliver all of their uh, production to them. Uh, that's one model, and so it, it depends because it's not all exactly the same the way that the proceeds are handled. Uh, so I, just to speak for Ocean Spray, I think what what does help, and it's good and bad, right? I mean, when we have a bad year. I mean, the, the in terms of what we sell and the money we make, the the farms have a tough year. But I think what makes it, you know, more of a partnership is that the the ownership uh, gets the full proceeds of what what the team makes. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Tom. Um, Niaz, there's a question here. Um, my father's a commercial lobsterman, so hearing what Niaz had to say resonated. Uh, and he talks a little bit about the price fluctuation and um, lobstermen are not the most trustworthy, he says, so they haven't figured out a way to work together cooperatively. Um, but I know my father's biggest issue is sustaining his business, is dealing with government regulations, which focus on restricting his ability to fish in certain areas, certain times of the year. Do you have any plans or initiatives on how to deal with those regulations? Well, <clears throat> God, that's a big question because I feel like um, regulations are often used to somehow suggest that we don't need government regulations we do need government regulations. You know, we actually are in favor of governments playing a role in our food system. What we're not in favor of are regulations that are actually designed for 
the bigger players, the industrial scale players. And uh, as a result, they're not scalable to the more community-based, small scale, localized players. And this is some of the struggles that lobstermen have. And I think when, uh, in the case of land food, issues, it really came home to roost for me when I was visiting a dairy farm, regularly, relatively small dairy farm. And honestly, when it comes to that parallels between fishing and farming, I feel like dairy farming has most in common when it comes to the challenges of those farmers and uh, with fisheries than any other part of agriculture. Anyway, we're sitting in this dairy farm <clears throat> And they were talking about how they needed to uh, build a new manure trench uh, in order to be compliant. But the only um, specs, if you will, that the USDA person was offering them was for a dairy farm that had a thousand plus cows. These guys have a hundred cows. The idea of needing to build a manure facility for that scale of operation when their operation is one tenth of what the specs are and the cost involved is that thousand cow um, manure facility. I feel like because the current system values what they consider to be the most efficient, the most industrialized, the ones who can catch, kill, grow the most at the lowest cost of production, all of the regulations are designed for that scale of operation, making it really hard for the small scale folks to function and exist. Some of that happens in fisheries where um, some of the regulations are best suited for that industrial, the moronic scale of, of fishing operations and has disproportionate impact on the smaller scale. What we've chosen to do as an organization is not to try to pick out every one of these regulations, fisheries by fisheries, region by region, but actually go to the source, figure out what is the congressional mandate that is leading to these regulations and address those in the next fish bill reauthorization. What's the global mandate that's trickling down to a local level and address those at the UN level, for instance, right now, working on the UN guidelines for sustainable small scale fisheries to address these sort of issues. So it may be too high scale, too, uh, too far up in the altitude for the lobsterman who is experiencing this in this moment, but, it, but my experience in the last almost 30 years of working on fisheries issues is when we work on that minutia scale, we keep having to go back and keep fighting over and over and over again. So we have to at some point start by um, working on that bigger scale policy so that we address all the little ones on the ground that are happening. That's where we're planning to spend our time. Global policies that trickle down, federal mandates that trickle down to lobstermen, fishermen, farmers, ranchers, everyone that provides us with our food. Great, thank you, Niaz. Um, here's another question. This could be for, for all of the speakers. Um, could you please expand upon what features of democratic empowerment and enlightened leadership you think are most critical to achieve a sustainable food system? Who would like to start? I feel like I just talked, so I don't want to talk continuously, <laughs> but I'm happy to go if no one else wants to start. Sure, go ahead, Nias. Well, I guess there are two um, layers of this. One is those who are actually have their hands in the soil and in the water, and what are the um, enlightened leadership and democratic control, democratic empowerment elements that apply to them. And then there is those of us who are in this work as stewards of this work. What does that mean and how do we practice that? Uh, for us, it means that our work is led by our members on our network. We don't conjure up something in our minds and then go back to the fishermen and farmers and say, what do you think about us doing this? You know, we wait for issues to percolate up from the base of our organizations. And I, amazingly enough, the two organizations, uh, membership and networks, have similar challenges. They're dealing with corporate domination of their systems and they're dealing with lack of economic justice within their system, lack of infrastructure. And so the issue needs to come 
from the communities most impacted by this. That is how we practice democratic empowerment. And then we reach out and we try to see where is that issue reverberated? Where are the ripple effects? And then we go and try to address those ripple effects as well. And then get people engaged. We don't want to build an empire. We want to build a movement. We try to really get our farmers, fishermen, ranchers to be the spokespeople, to be the ones who are meeting with their members of Congress. Not us, because I'm just a cog in the wheel, making sure their work is, is furthering. But then those of us who are the cogs in the wheel, that I think is where this enlightened leadership really needs to play a role for us each to know what is our purpose in this work? What is the best role that we can play in this work? Uh, some of my, myself included, consider this sort of personal search for purpose to be a little too woo woo, a little too whatever touchy feely. But honestly, I think it's an um, important place for all of us as advocates, as activists, as organizers to start from so that we know um, who are we serving? What, are, what is our role here? Um, how do we best bring our best self into this work so that those who we're serving are benefiting from our presence? And there are a bunch of leadership trainings that I could recommend to folks who want to really better understand what their role is in the system that um, uh, I, I think it's worth investing in, whether it's the Institute for Nonprofit Practice here in New England or a national level Rockwood Leadership Institute, there are systems in place to allow you to touch into that place that, that gives you the opportunity to really bring that enlightenment into your own leadership system, um, style. Great, Niaz, and thanks for offering uh, resources. We can share whatever you have to share uh, and the like. Um, Anybody want to else get in on that one? Otherwise, I'll go to the next question. Tom. Yeah, I was just going to add real quickly. You know, one of the things that we didn't have uh, before in a large way is a government relations team. Um, and we just hired a, a director from Walmart, actually. And she just, uh, I want to say, started three or four weeks ago. And the reason why that's important to us is that we, as a co-op, can bring, and we do, our farmers to DC to talk about the issues that are most important to them. And you know, each one of our directors, we have um, beyond myself, we have 14 other directors. Uh, each one of them is a is a grower owner in addition to being, you know, an elected director. And they, you know, have a lot of influence locally in their own, you know, sort of geographies. But we're starting to, you know, say, well, what's the power of this? the 700 strong co-op going to um, you know, our elected officials in a constructive way to talk about those things that are the most important to agriculture and to you know, our co-op specifically. Great, great, Gerardo. Yeah, I, I would add an, another perspective there. The, the co-op system by its design uh, already built in a lot of the democratic um, element to it. And normally the way I mentally picture this is that in a traditional corporate organization, it's basically like a, a pyramid, like a triangle, and then the person at the top of the persons that are guiding, right? The, in the case of these uh, uh, cooperatives that we work with is, I would say is, yes, there is a triangle, uh, but there is also an inverted triangle and both of them uh, work, right? The, invert, the inverted triangle is the membership somehow uh, communicating to, to the leadership, what are the values, what they want and what, uh, what they seek. And uh, based on those values, that leadership uh, then implementing that, right? So it's uh, rather than just having one triangle is, uh, I view it as having two triangles, one, uh, the normal one that one ambitions and the other one inverted. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Gerardo. Um, Tom Hayes has a question here. Um, what are some of Ocean Spray's sustainable methods regarding the supply chain and operations? Are there any big plans in the future for this? Yeah, so um, I'm trying to also answer them. I don't type fast enough in the chat for everybody. Oh, okay. No, no, not this one, Tom. But okay. I, uh, I'll try to get to as many as I can. Um, you know, uh, but 
Sure. And some of the dialogue that's happening is, you know, we're really, really proud of the farming aspects of being a regenerative crop. Like I said in my, uh, my prepared remarks is that that's a great, great place to start where we have a chance to go further definitely is in operations. So uh, waste to landfill, energy use, water use at our plants, big focus. Um, do I have the answers for you that, you know, here's we're making substantial progress today. I don't um, because we haven't had a lot of reps at you know getting the data, making sure that we're corralling you know uh, all the opportunities we have and executing against those as a group independently. Some plants have done you know a nice job. On the packaging front, we are looking for making our packaging more friendly, uh, eco-friendly. We have this you know the Craisins bag, which um, hopefully most of you know. Uh, is not a, hasn't been a sustainable package. We're uh, introducing a sustainable package there, compostable package, uh, recyclable package. Um, and we, uh, I mentioned, we got involved with Loop and we're trying to do more things with them. So uh, returnable cans, we've got a tin can, you can buy a tin can of cranberries, uh, uh, sweet and dried cranberries, uh, the craisins, and um, you know, participate in the Loop system you know, with those. But uh, there's a lot of PET that we buy. We have lots of plastic bottles and uh, juice bottles on shelf. And so um, you should you know, continue to hold us accountable to making that better. But we're, we're more getting started there than I would say you know, uh, well-developed. So yeah, work to do. Great, thank you, Tom. Um, our colleague, Colleen Stewart has a, a question what framing or phrasing do you find most successful in educating about aspects of democratic empowerment and the cooperative model to those who are not aware or may be averse to the concept? Anybody want in on that one? That's a question that I deal with on a on a normal, regular basis, uh, right? Because we do work with cooperatives and also some of our work is non-cooperatives. And uh, normally, I think my view is the, the I think Tom Hayes re refers to this before as well, is that it's not the only model, right? So the, uh, Cooperatives, uh, I think, are, uh, cooperatives are is just a, 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 a structure, right? The, it works well in certain situations, and it may not work as well on other situations. So the the idea of a, of a, of a cooperative, I think, it depends to some extent on this, the situation. Like I think when people uh, normally the reaction when I, 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 I talk this way, the people see that I'm open. It's not like I'm mentioning cooperative is the only solution. And that normally uh, opens the space to talk about uh, in a specific situation, what could be the benefits and how they, the cooperative work. So I, I, I find that that openness has been helpful to me in explaining or trying to transmit the message of co-ops. To... Great, great. Thank you, Gerardo. So I'm watching the clock here. And what I'd like to do is um, just give each of you a minute if you have any sort of closing thoughts. As, as we come to an end here, um, just on anything you heard or the general question of, of the day. So why don't we, Tom, we'll start with you. We'll go in the order that we spoke in. Sure. Um, so closing thoughts. I, there's a lot of participation in this. I, I don't know what the usual attendance is, but you know, it looked like it was about 500 people or so. So thanks for joining. And I would say that, uh, this is a team effort, you know, to uh, make our food system more sustainable. And what I have noticed in my career, there's a lot of finger pointing about who's doing what wrong and who's doing uh, things that could be challenged. And I think that's right to, to, you know, make sure that we impress on people they need to go further. My advice, uh, for whatever it's worth, would be to read the book, uh, 
The Drawdown by uh, Paul Hawken. I don't know how many of you have read that, but um, I'm having met him and also just uh, listening to you know him speak a few times. There's a a cry for collaboration that is uh, you know big that comes out of you know his his uh, points of view and work, and I think that's that's gonna you know cause us to go uh, a lot farther trying to get folks to encourage work drive and you know take this all on together. So uh, just just one man's point of view. Yeah. No, no, Thank you great. very much, yeah, Tom and Fiona. Yeah, collaboration. Um, Nias. Yeah, echoing the gratitude for having this conversation and for folks participating. Unlike Tom Hayes, I suck at dealing with the chat and the Q&A at the same time <laughs> as I'm trying to listen. So if I missed any questions, I'll be happy to take those offline if someone wanted to reach out. I guess for me, the final thoughts would be, you know, we talk about uh, food systems and it's easy to feel bogged down, no pun intended with cranberries, to feel bogged down in the pain and the injustice and the lack of access. Um, but there's a lot of joy in the food systems world. It is, you know, food, air, water are the three things we all share as humans as our basic needs. And it's what we come around to celebrate with and, and to nourish our bodies and our minds with. And I feel like we need to tap into that joy to support those who brings us that joy, uh, to celebrate the ones who, um, you know, in the fisheries world, I talk about the difference between people who fish and the people who extract seafood. How do we celebrate the fishing people and uh, use our power to challenge the extractors? And that applies to fishing, it applies to farming, it applies to ranching, it applies to all aspects of our food system. So let's find those who actually bring us that joy in a holistic, sustainable way and celebrate them and come together to build those the power that we need um, to fight against the extraction systems that are undermining their ability to do their work and our ability to access good food. Great, thank you, um, Niaz. Uh, Gerardo. Yeah, I have... Um comment and also a quick question for Tom Hayes. The comment is the, sometimes all these problems seem so big, so huge, right? That it's difficult to think how one can tackle them. And uh, I think in this presentation, we have seen the three people started something that uh, ended up becoming ocean spray. Uh, I showed four persons that started in a, a food cooperative in Alaska, uh, which, and that was the first food cooperative in Alaska. What, the, what I observe here is that a few persons can be an agent of change. Uh, so they, they, they have the confidence that uh, two or three people can be an agent of change, right? And uh, the quick question for Tom Hayes is, I was thinking now we're getting closer to Thanksgiving time to what is what we're going to have on the table for Thanksgiving and so on. And I see the name of Ocean Spray prominently mentioned here. Did he have anything to do with the timing of this presentation? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I, I actually I was invited by Tom and Fiona. Maybe they thought they yeah, were getting close to Thanksgiving. This is the appropriate time, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Much. yeah. We're getting a marketing finder's fee, right, <laughs> Tom, for that. Well, uh, I want to bring this to a close and really ending on those, those final thoughts of collaboration, joy, and the power of a small number of people to um, make something happen. Uh, I think it's a great way to end. So again, Sincerest thanks to, to our speakers. Thank you for taking the time to share with us. Uh, thanks to all of our colleagues who helped to organize this. And of course, to all the participants. Uh, I think it's been a really fruitful, no pun intended discussion um, to uh, give us all food for thought. So Fiona, do you have any closing uh, role here or we're just taking it out? You can take it out. Um, just to say that we, again, thank you to our fantastic speakers today. I think events like this are important because they really help remind us of the interconnectedness of our world, and the critical sustainability issues we face. But we've heard today some for some great 
leaders who are using the power of business, but also nonprofits and activism to really create a more sustainable food system. We hope that you will join us on December the 2nd. Our keynote speaker then is the wonderful Tulane Montgomery, who will be talking about how we bridge the resource gap for entrepreneurs to transform America's most inequitable system. So hope you'll join us on December the 2nd. And thanks again to Tom Hayes, to Niaz, to Gerardo, and of course, the wonderful Tom Kelly. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you. Bye.